is on tap presented by the Museum of Natural and Cultural History. My name is Lauren and I'd like to start this evening by recognizing that the museum and the University of Oregon are located on Kalapuya Ilahi, the traditional indigenous homeland of the Kalapuya people. We recognize and honor all indigenous peoples who continue to call the Willamette Valley home. Although we might not be together in person for Ideas on Tap, we do still want to hear your questions and your comments. If you're joining us on Zoom, you can use the Q&A feature or the chat box. And if you're on Facebook, you can use the comment box for your questions and your comments. I'll be collecting your questions across both platforms and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. I'd also like to begin by giving a shout out to the staff at Viking Braggett Company who hosted our Ideas on Tap program at their Southtown location in pre-COVID times. During tonight's talk, we'll be posting a link to a brief survey in the comments on both Zoom and Facebook. Please consider taking a minute or two to fill, out, to fill it out after the talk. Not only will your feedback help us improve future virtual programs, but you'll be entered to win a $25 gift card to Viking Braggett. If you enjoy tonight's program, we are asking that you please consider making a secure tax deductible donation of five to $10 at the web address listed on the screen to help keep museum programs like this one accessible to all. That's giving.uoregon.edu slash MNCH gift. Your donation directly supports museums educational programming bringing science and culture adventures to Oregonians of every age and in every corner of the state. Thank you. I have a few upcoming museum programs I'd like to share with you all. This month, the museum celebrates Charles Darwin's birthday with our annual Darwin Conversations. Our 2021 speakers will explore current extinction trends and weigh the pros and cons of bringing extinct species back to life. First up, on Thursday, February 18th, you're invited to join Douglas McCauley, a marine ecologist at the University of California, Santa Barbara, to explore the science behind current mass extinctions and whether de-extinction can help us put on the brakes. The following week, on Thursday, February 25th, join Ross McPhee, curator at the American Museum of Natural History, for a discussion about whether it's a good idea to bring back extinct species, including the possibilities and pitfalls of de-extinction biology. Both of this year's Darwin Conversations, as well as tonight's Ideas on Tap presentation, are made possible with support from the University of Oregon's Wayne Morris Center for Law and Politics. Lastly, I hope that you'll join me next month for another Ideas on Tap. On Wednesday, March 3rd, UO sociologist Claire Herbert will discuss Eugene's affordable housing crisis and what it means for the city's students, former prisoners, and others at risk for experiencing homelessness. If you can join us live for Ideas on Tap or for the Darwin Conversations, we do post recordings of all of our virtual talks to the museum's YouTube page the following day, so be sure to check out any talks that you've missed. And now with that, it's my pleasure to welcome tonight's speaker, Kelly Walker, Senior Keeper of California Condors at the Oregon Zoo. Kelly has overseen the conservation breeding program for this critically endangered bird at the zoo's Johnson Center for Wildlife Conservation since 2004. Welcome, Kelly. Thank you. All right. I think I'm on. Um, hi, my name is uh, Kelly Walker and I have been working with California Condors since 2004, since the facility opened. Um, our, basically our goal is to um, breed condor uh, chicks for release into the wild um, to make basically a self-sustained population or several self-sustained populations. Um, my talk is going to be kind of loose. I have a bunch of pictures that I'm just kind of going to talk about. See where we get. Um, this first picture actually is kind of uh, cool. Um, 
the adult male, the big black guy is um, number 340. He is the first condor um, that was released from Oregon Zoo into the wild. And that is his newly hatched chick uh, in the wild. So um, they were doing a welfare check on that check, uh, on that chick in the nest. And that's the picture they snapped. So it's kind of cool. He's still, he's still out there breeding. Um, sorry. Oops. Um, so our facility is 52 acres fenced in. Um, and we have 16 breeding pens, plus some flight cages and a pre-release cage for our birds. This is um, what our pen looks like. Um, this is actually one side of the pen. Uh, so we've got our breeding barns that are kind of that orangish color. Uh, that's where our breeding pens are. And then to the side of that is a very long flight cage. The black stuff that is up is this visual barrier. We want to keep the birds as isolated from people and noise and just human induced stuff um, as much as possible. So on some of those sides where we come in and bring food in, uh, we have that visual barrier up so they can't see us traipsing around bringing in uh, the food because we never want to be associated with feeding and such. So that's just what those black tarps are. This is a look at one of our pens through one way glass. We view our birds. We do 90% of the monitoring of these birds um, through cameras, through our camera system. Um, again, we never want them to see us. We don't want them to hear us. We want to be something that they're scared of and don't want anything to do with. So when we go down and feed in the barns, um, we look at the pens, the breeding pairs and chicks and such through one way glass. So this is what we're seeing. Uh, in that front view, uh, you'll see there's a scale right there with a weird log thing on it. Um, every pen has a scale in it. And what this does is birds weight um, tell a lot about the condition of the bird. Since we don't handle these birds except for once a year for physicals, uh, we will, when they feed, this is actually a midway stop between the snag that that bird is sitting on up at the top, um, that's a teach one. Uh, they'll go, they'll kind of land on the scale, we can get a weight on them, and then they'll go down to the food room and pull out the food. So that's actually a very good way to monitor um, bird's health, and we can actually see it really well through the one-way glass and, and make sure everything's okay. Um, chicks will get up there and bounce around and we'll be able to get the weight on those. Um, you can see in this picture kind of how big these snags are. Our pins are 50 by 35 by 30 feet tall. Um, they're very, very large. Well, as large as we can get them, not for a condor, but they're pretty good size. Um, all the pins have a, like a large snag in them. Um, they also we put in logs and stumps and such because they love to like rip apart stuff and dig in stuff. Um, condors are like monkeys with feathers. Um, I mean, whatever they can destroy, they will destroy. Uh, so we kind of have to make their area bomb proof. Um, one of the things we don't do uh, at our breeding facility is um, like enrichment at the zoo, we do no man-made materials except obviously the scale and such, but we don't put in toys, we don't put in plastic, we don't do a sprinkler in the summer. Um, we don't want anything that's not natural um, to be in there. So California condors mate for life, theoretically. Um, when one of them dies or disappears, uh, they will a lot of times seek a new mate, but sometimes it takes several years. Um, because just because they mate for life doesn't mean that the egg that comes out of the female is that male's going to be chick. Um, they have been known to stray a little bit at feeding sites. Um, but they will incubate together, they will raise the chick together, they will use the same nest site um, for as long as that pair is together. 
Um, so they do, they do bond and mate for life, but uh, again, occasionally there's some genetics going on that the male might not know about. Um, so uh, this is, again, we watch all of our birds on cameras. So right now, literally right now, um, these are our nest room cameras. We have 16 nest rooms. Uh, and right now we have 14 breeding pens. Uh, we have eight eggs already, which is very rare for end of January, beginning of February. So this picture actually I took two days ago. Um, there's the names on them. You'll see it says uh, Zoo, JCWC, blah, blah, blah. A3 nest room 702-43. That is the pair. So 702 and 43 is Ostis and Malibu. That is the pair that that nest room belongs in. So every nest room um, has its own pair of 55, 756, 491, 174. Um, you can see on kind of the middle left on my screen, uh, you can see an egg. There's an actual egg in the sandbox. Um, and that pair is doing an egg shift um, switch. There's also, we're super proud, I'm just going to tell you, we're super proud of this male. It's his first year kind of with the female. It's his first year of displaying, of populating. He's just seen his first egg like two days ago. He's, he did pretty well with it. Um, but that's the pair. It's the second line, second row down, third one over. It's 491 and 174. That's, um, so she's done a really good job. And today was the first day he incubated. He left her alone for two days, but she was very patient. And so we are very excited. They don't do well when they incubate the first time. I don't say they don't do well. Um, they can't get comfortable on it. They're like, oh, well, you know, you did it. And they try to, and they shuffle around. They're like, it's really round and it's super uncomfortable. So sometimes um, they'll be very gentle with it, but they'll kind of take it with them. Like they'll go lay somewhere and then be like, well, you can come here, little egg, and they'll sit by it. Um, but anyway, we're super proud. He started incubating today. So that's that's what we watch. We watch the hatching process. We watch the behaviors, um, the double clutching. We watch, we watch everything. So that's how we get all our information. Same idea in um, the breeding pens. We have six pan tilt zooms um, that monitor each side. We've got um, eight pens each side. Uh, these are basically what we're looking at uh, during the day. Um, you'll see several pens, you'll see the birds in there. Um, again, each snag, each one has a, a big snag, it has a pool, um, the scale. You can see the barns from here. So um, what you've got is the barns are two stories. And that top window underneath those kind of awnings, those great awnings right below the roof, um, those are the nest room entrances. Um, and those lead directly into the rooms that you just saw. So all of our nest rooms are on the second floor. And uh, we shut down um, the barns, the breeding facility. Nobody goes in to, comes down there except for keepers. Um, and we don't even go upstairs uh, until we need to do something with the eggs or the chicks because uh, that is their very safe spot. And like somebody like me, who's totally clumsy, you know, we don't want to be tripping or causing a ruckus up there. So, and then the first floor, you'll see um, kind of two lower openings under that ledge, that artificial ledge. That is our food room and also where we catch birds uh, when we need to get our hands on them. We don't ever try to catch the birds out of the pens because the pens are so big and you risk kind of hurting the birds, the keepers. Uh, the only time we've really done that was when we had to evacuate for the fire. Um, we had to evacuate 36 birds um, and get them out uh, and three goats. Uh, so that was kind of a nightmare, but, um, otherwise we like to trap them in the food room, uh, where they get their food and then we can go in. The other birds don't get stressed out watching us, uh, net the bird and, and handle the bird. So that's kind of what we're looking at. 
And then this is just kind of a close up um, of the pens that you're seeing. You can see that's 421 sitting up there on the snag. Um, at the uh, lower left hand corner, you'll see um, their, their gate. It's a gate and it's actually open. Most breeding pens have a single pen. This pair, this is 357 and 421. This pair has two pens that they can access. 357, the female has a, an old wing injury um, and she's non-flighted. Uh, she got in the field, uh, she, the wing tag got injured. It snapped a tendon. She's non-flighted. She's tough as nails, but she's non-flighted. Um, her mate is, is 421. Um, he is not the brightest but he's very good looking. Um, he has some, some anger issues sometimes. So we wanted her, she's a really fast runner. Uh, we wanted her to get enough room and have enough room to get away from him when he would start to chase her or harass her. So this particular pair will probably always leave with uh, two pens. Um, she's, she's done great with that. She'll go into the food room when she doesn't want anything else to do with them. Um, he usually respects that space. And if he's just after her, we'll go ahead and close her in that food room overnight. We'll give her a bunny. We'll set it up with water. She can rest and then we'll let her out, uh, in the morning. He's actually gotten much better as he's matured. Um, he's had a couple of chicks now. Um, and he kind of went from being the mauler. He, he mauled a couple of chicks, but they're fine. Uh, to now he's like the helicopter dad. He doesn't want the chick to get uh, anywhere like five feet from him. So he'll, he just follows the chick around. Um, so he's, he's a good bird. He's trying. So the nest rooms, which you saw, this is kind of um, a close up. The nest rooms are rather, they're built rather large. They're um, much larger than a lot of times you'll find in the wild. So one of the problems that we had is when we would go in to switch out an egg or a hatching chick or something, occasionally the birds would decide that the furthest corner away from our egg doors was the best place to have their egg, which made it a nightmare because they're not supposed to see you open anything in the nest room. We don't want to lock them out because that stresses it. We like to just open what we call these egg doors and do a quick switch. So the right hand picture is, um, is what we call the sandbox. Uh, we created just, uh, I think they're two by tens, um, into a corner and that corner has really, really thick sand in it. Um, the rest of the room has pretty thin sand. Uh, so, and condors traditionally have always really liked to lay in corners, um, kind of in the darkest corner. So we pick that corner and they'll get in there and they'll just be like, oh, this is fantastic. But what that barrier does, it actually does a couple things. Um, it stops them from rolling the egg where we can't reach it. It also gives us a little bit of a visual shelter from the outside door. So when we do reach in um, and if they glance in or something, they're not going to see us there. Um, it also keeps the wind off the egg. So, and it's worked out really well. This is the third year that we're doing it. We just kind of install this because we like to do different stuff and be like, how can we make this better? How can we make this better? So that worked out great. Um, the picture on the left is actually 421 and 357. And you can actually see on her wing, um, the, the, the side of the body that's facing you has a little white kind of spot on it. That's her wing injury. What they're looking at is a basically a reflective piece of plastic. That's our egg door, but they, this pair enjoys looking at themselves. Um, so they'll hang out together and look at themselves in the egg door. So we have uh, two egg doors per nest room, um, just to make sure we have access to all sides, just in case. Um, it's, it's obviously a little door, but what we do is when we have to get in there, we'll sneak up, it's completely dark upstairs. We'll sneak up there, wait for the bird to completely exit the room. And then um, as quietly as we can, we have like these little latches that are silent, everything's silent. Um, we just open that door, do our little business and lock it back up. And then we give them their mirror back. 
so this has actually worked great. And because it's one way, it allows us to see in there and see what the birds are doing and the birds can't see us at all. So that works brilliantly. Uh, currently, yes, we have 31 birds, 14 breeding pairs. Um, we do have three adult males on exhibit. Um, a lot of exhibit birds are potential breeders. Um, so 491 and 869 are on exhibit. Also number 42, Kauea is on exhibit. Um, 491 and 869 are potential breeders. Uh, they will never be released. Their genetics are very valuable. Um, once something hits um, an exhibit is deemed non-releasable, um, but that doesn't mean that they won't raise really good chicks. The same practice um, occurs within the zoo. They can't see the keeper's feed. Um, they will never associate the keepers with food. Obviously they're very accustomed to people and such, but um, again, they're not given um, enrichment except for like new logs or you know different, maybe a big trout or something. So we try to keep them, um, the potential breeders um, very accustomed to kind of the rules that we have out here. Um, we do have an adult male, uh, Kauaia, on exhibit. He's kind of my favorite bird. I love him. Um, I would keep him in my office if I could, but he'd be a nightmare. Uh, so he was a breeder for a very long time at LA, I believe, and uh, produced a lot of chicks. Um, great personality. He's an extremely curious bird. He has no fear of humans. Like nobody knows why, because he wasn't treated any differently, but he loves to like get in there and see what we're doing. But um, he decided after he had bred for several years that the eggs were more fun to break than they were to raise. So that doesn't, it's not very conducive to a breeding project. So he was pulled out and they were kind of deciding uh, what to do with him. Um, I offered to take him and we did try him as a mentor bird, which was a utter failure because our mentor birds, um, are there, and I'll go more into this later, but basically they manage, uh, the juvenile birds that are going to be released. Um, and they show them proper behaviors and make sure everybody's in line. Kauia would be like, humans coming in, let's go see what they're doing. Be like, no, you can't do that. So when our exhibit came online, I was like, you're an AK Kuya. So he loves it. He, um, we do feed whole calves there, rats, rabbits, meat. Um, he will bring, drag that calf all the way down to like this front huge giant window, proceed to just go to town on it and like watch the people parade. He's awesome. So I, I love that bird. Um, today we've had egg, uh, eight eggs uh, laid this year. Today, three were confirmed uh, fertile. We've got four in the incubators right now. The rest are still um, down in our uh, nest rooms. Um, this is kind of a record for us. We think part of the reason we have so many so early is because when we did evacuate for um, the fire, we took all of the chicks uh, to Boise um, and half of our adult, the, uh, adult birds. We left all of our chicks there so they weren't handled over and over. Um, so that left the pairs to their own devices for a couple months. Um, and also the weather's just been crazy nice. So everybody's been going to town. So we've got eight eggs. We don't know how many we're gonna get this year. Uh, it's too early to say and I'm not going to jinx it, but we'll get more eggs. Um, to date, yes, we have had 130 eggs laid, 85 have hatched. Um, it seems kind of like a huge number laid and not a huge number hatched. Um, reason being, especially here, we have a lot of young birds that, uh, that are newly paired. It takes them a while to figure out the whole breeding thing, um, especially males, they have to figure out like how to mount and populate and sometimes it's just atrocious. Um, but the females uh, will just lay an egg anyway, uh, even though it's not fertile, they'll just drop an egg. So we've had a lot of that happen and sometimes uh, even the, the pairs that we've had, they just lay in fertile eggs, which is fine. And then a lot of times we'll double clutch or we'll get an egg from Boise or LA or something. Um, 
we like to have all the pairs raise. Um, this year is going to be interesting. Again, new pairs, we're not quite sure, but since 491 has started incubating, maybe we'll try a chick with, with them because he's done a great job. So we're going to, we, this is kind of a play it by ear as you go type deal. Um, the seven chicks that, um, we had hatched last year. Uh, usually we would have in our pre-release pen and they would get shipped out in September. Those are also in Boise. Uh, and um, they are gonna be released from Boise. So we have, we have no young birds right now. Incubation. So we do at some point incubate all of the eggs that are laid at the facility. Um, there's a few reasons for that. It's not because the birds can't raise, you know, they, they incubate wonderfully. Um, but sometimes because we're in captivity and the birds are in such close quarters, given where they normally would be on a mountainside with hundreds of miles around, um, they tend to squabble and fight more uh, and can inadvertently kick or hurt that egg. Um, I've, I've had it happen, um, and the egg died, uh, before I could, you know, get to it. It was on day one. Um, so that's one reason we pull eggs. Another reason we really want to see if they're fertile or not. Um, if we pull the egg, it's infertile. We're like, okay, maybe we can have them double clutch, which means, uh, they go into breeding mode again and recycle and lay, lay another egg. Uh, we also like to see that the egg is, the development is progressing normally. So that picture in the top right, um, that is egg number four, um, 2016. OZO4 is our fourth egg of 2016. So sorry, it's an old picture. Um, but you can see the vesseling on it that's being held up to a candler uh, that Spot on top, actually the dark spot is the eye spot. So that's, that's the kid's eye. Um, all that vesseline is coming out of the embryo, which is kind of that mass that is surrounding that dark spot. This egg is actually developing really, really nicely. Um, all that vesseline, the cam is eventually gonna go around the entire egg and that embryo gets bigger and bigger. We candle uh, once a week to make sure everything is, is going okay. Um, and we do this to each and every egg. We candle once a week um, to see development and we do a weight loss. There's a strict weight loss curve. We like them to lose about 15%. Um, if they lose less, like 13, it's usually kind of a wet and uh, messy hatch sometimes um, and results in more problems for the chick. So they are weighed every day. Um, the other reason we pull everything is occasionally we need to trade eggs or send eggs out to different facilities um, that are in need of something that have had an emergency like, oh my gosh, this chick died. We, you know, we need a hatching egg right now. Um, and Oregon would be like, okay, yes, we have one that's hatching in two days. Somebody will actually fly up with our portable, with the portable incubator that looks like a bomb um on the airplane it's plugged in battery there's numbers on it it flashes it looks like a bomb um but fly up on the airplane um we will meet them at the airport put the egg in the portable incubator they will turn around and fly back to california and um all the facilities do that usually boise we just drive um so that is that is another reason um that we have all the eggs uh available until hatch um is in case of emergency so the lower left hand picture is what our incubation room looks like it's super sterile um there's not much in there because we don't want things sitting around we don't want dust on it it is we go through once a week we spray everything down everything is sterilized we go in with special rubber boots that only are in incubation room. Everything is gloved. You don't touch anything. You spray everything down with alcohol. Um, you can do surgery in here. Um, so that's what our incubation room looks like. And then on the right hand side, you'll see um, an x-ray. Uh, that is a chicken and egg. And when we have, we're candling um, an egg that's close to hatch, 
and something's not right about it. I mean, we, we have enough experience to be like, there's just something hinky about this. Um, and we can't quite put our finger on it and it should be doing something, but it's not. Um, we will go in and uh, have an x-ray uh, done to make sure that chick is in the right position. Birds hatch uh, the same way in every egg all the time. There's a position they need to be in and we need to make sure they're in it. So I wish I could show you like how to laser pointer, but um, you can see the leg on the bottom and then curled around, that is the, the top of the head is sitting right over that leg. And then you can see the beak kind of coming up and it's pointing, pointing that way, um, and the eye. So, and it's 3D and we have to figure it out. But anyway, we do x-ray eggs to make sure the chick's in the right position. And if it needs air, we do break in and I'll have more pictures of that, huh, like this. So again, I'm sorry, I wish I had a laser pointer. Um, I don't, um, this particular chick, it was supposed to um, be hatching at a certain time and, and actually break in and breathe. And it, it wasn't doing what we uh, wanted it to do. So it started out with the egg shell on the left-hand side. Um, we, we punch a big hole, as small as we can, but we need to get in there. Punch a hole in there, and you have to remember that you have active vesseling, and if you don't shut down all that vesseling and you nick one of those, your chick will bleed to death. Um, so you very slowly um, shut down all the vesseling where you want to go, and you have to so this is a straight on picture of the pink thing in front is actually the wing and there's the crook of the wing. So it's like right here. Um, and then directly behind it is the um, beak and that little white thing on the beak is the egg tube. That is what they use to hatch out of the shell. So the problem with this is that the wing is actually, um, prohibiting the beak from touching the shell. The wing is in the way of that beak hitting the shell and cracking. So what I did was, um, and again, try to make everything as sterile as possible. On the second picture, um, I actually put, I, I got the wing up and was able to shove the beak under the wing so it could hit the eggshell. So what you're seeing in the second picture is that pink thing has moved behind the big gray thing, which is, and you can see his little crack, that's his mouth and his little egg tooth. Um, so voila, he's fixed, kind of. Um, and then you cover this all back up with like sterile, I use um, like a sterile cardboard. Um, so he has something to push on and you only leave a tiny, tiny, tiny little hole for air so the membranes don't dry out. And they can actually, I've had chicks um, actually rotate and hatch out uh, just fine after this whole procedure. Um, so that's, that was kind of an easy fix. Um, we also have some harder fixes. Um, there's some eggs that just don't really cook properly. Um, we can't get the weight loss off of them. This I think was Wheelox egg. We always had problems getting weight loss off Wheelox egg. Um, and they they just they they just are kind of loose in there. Their their beak can't get up in that air cell. So um, what we do then is we go in and we hatch that chick out. Uh, it can be a very long process. Um, what we do is a lot of times we will make a, a hole in that shell and make sure and punch a little bit around their beak to make sure they can get air. That's the first thing, and maybe give a little bit of room for them to start moving. Uh, we want all of that membrane, that blood to be shut down. We don't wanna break into an egg when you have active vesseling. It's a really bad idea. Um, so what we'll do is we'll break it a little bit um, at a time, cover it back up and we'll do it maybe twice a day, stick it back in the incubator and warm them up and they'll move a little bit more. And then you take them out again, you sterilize everything, you take them. So this particular chick, I think I spent five days hatching this kiddo out. Um, and that is it on the lower right hand side. They're not pretty when they come out. And he's got a little bit of fluid, but this chick was fine. We put him um, beta down their little belly buttons, chicks have belly buttons. Um, and then we put him in the ICU and uh, he fluffed up and was totally fine. <laughs> 
this is what they look like uh, when they dry off. Um, maybe not 20, quite 24 hours old. Um, but what we do when we assist hatch a chick is uh, we've got some nice warm ICU um, fruiters. They, uh, we make sure the humidity's up, basically cover them with the towel, make sure it's dark and, and really quiet. And they just sleep um, and, and recover. Uh, Cause that was a pretty traumatic thing. Uh, spent a lot of energy getting them out of there. So um, the next morning we'll go in, we'll look at them. Um, make sure they can hold their head up. If they can hold their head up and they, they uh, can kind of position themselves, they're good to go. And if their belly button looks all like the seal is good, um, it makes them very angry. Um, we have condor eggshells from the infertile eggs that we blow out, dry, sterilize. So these guys actually get shoved back in an egg, which makes them angry. Um, and then we tape them in the egg um, and put them into a nest room um, that's supposed to have had a hatching chick, but we put them in there um, and they hatch out of um, the egg that we taped them into. It actually works brilliant. Um, we try to only give them to pairs that are experienced that won't mind that they have a dry fluffy chick that just walked out of its eggshell. They'll just be like, oh, look at my chick, he's fabulous. Um, so that is our rehatching technique. Uh, we try to do it when they're less than two, three days old because they, they fit better. Um, I think LA's done one that was like 11 days old and obviously doesn't fit into an egg anymore. So what they did is they just crushed up an egg and kind of plopped the chicken and threw an eggshell around it and was like, ta-da. Um, and it worked. So uh, it's just because the parents are in breeding mode. Um, and yeah, we've never had a problem with it. Knock on wood. Um, yeah, so we try never to puppet raise, um, and only in emergencies. Condors are very, very, very social beings and take a lot of their cues. They take all of their cues and behaviors and stuff from learning from their parents. They're in that nest room for, for five to six months before they, they come out. So they, they spend all of that time um, just hanging out with their parents. Um, and they, they don't get that when they're puppet raised. Um, we just, we can't reproduce it. Um, occasionally like this kiddo, um, the parents got in a fight, it was 174 and 145. Um, they're since divorced, we had to divorce them. Um, but they got into a fight over the newly hatched chick and uh, 145 took the chick and threw it out the nest room, like second floor, done, fight over. Um, so of course we are, we see this on camera, we run, you know, we're going as fast as possible, chick's out of the nest room, we go and this little chick um, has landed on like a little thing of grass. I was totally fine, it was ridiculous. Uh, so we raised him. His name's Muxley. Uh, he was released in Arizona, uh, but now I think he's back in captivity breeding at the Peregrine Fund. So he's, he's actually the first bird, um, first condor I've ever puppet raised. So, um, I kind of dig Muxley. Occasionally, um, we don't really do it so much anymore, um, because we have, plenty more breeding pairs and such, but we did for a while, the program would um, place eggs from breeding facilities uh, into wild nests to ensure that the wild pairs um, became kind of experienced breeders. They just didn't have enough uh, pairs out there and a lot of them were young, so they wanted to make nesting successful. So if there's this picture was taken by Joe Burnett. That's him sitting there. Um, he's got the um, incubator, the portable incubator with him. It's that red, white, and blue thing. Uh, the egg that he just put in there, and then the male is uh, the male of the nest is sitting there um, watching Joe, not being happy. So uh, that was another reason um, why we pulled uh, all the eggs up for incubation and just left dummy eggs, so we would be available for any wild nest that needed it. Um, they've got enough uh, experience 
uh, experienced birds and such out there right now that they don't really do that anymore. Um, but that was kind of cool. That was one of our eggs that, that went down in um, Southern California that Joe flew down. Um, so I, a lot of people, um, or some people have said like, oh my gosh, you're, you know, the nest rooms are so sterile and boring. Well, there's nothing really for wild condors to do in caves. They pick at the floor, they pick at the wall, they wait for their parents to come in. So this is what, um, the size of the nest rooms and the chicks compared to kind of the parents. So the, the top picture, that's Willie and Tomoko's chick, I think from two years ago. You can see his giant chest, that's his crop. He just got fed, um, so he's super, super happy. Uh, that's, they get a giant crop on them, parents just load them up. That right below that is actually that same chick. Uh, I'm not sure if that's with his mom and dad, if that's Willie or Tomoko. Um, but you can see all the stuff on the sand floor that they have to pick at. Believe me, these birds have no lack of junk to pick at. Um, the parents love bringing stuff up. When they erp stuff up, um, it kind of stays around. So there is plenty of stuff to pick at. Um, I did have one time, the only male that's ever done this, actually the only condor. Condors don't make a nest. They just lay an egg in the substrate. We did have one condor, Poxa. Um, he was kind of a manly man. Uh, but he loved to, when you'd, oh, when you'd clean the nest room, you'd open it up for breeding, um, he would spend probably two to three days um, collecting stuff out of the pen, um, rat jackets and old bones and feathers and whatever got his fancy, and he would bring them into the nest room, and he would strategically place them um, where he thought they looked really good. Um, and you could see it because he'd kind of arrange it and then he would literally back up and look at it and be like, ah, I don't like that. So he'd go and like move it over here. And it took him like two or three days to get everything settled as he wanted. There was no order that we could see. They were just scattered around the nest room, but he thought it was amazing. Um, and then he would go out to his woman and be like, let me an egg, I'm prepared. So he was always kind of fun to watch do the nest room stuff. Um, and just, uh, we're just looking in comparison to, this was a chick from, I believe last year, um, that they wing tagged up in, um, one of the redwoods. Um, so again, not, not much to do. There's a couple branches in there, but, um, and that chick has a much smaller space. Um, so they really are, are completely occupied. We have, um, when we're getting to release birds, um, we pull the juveniles out of uh, the breeding pens when they're about eight months old because we need the, uh, the breeding pair to get back in the breeding season to produce more eggs. So we pull those, those chicks out and we put them in this pen and this is our, our pre-release pen. It's super isolated. There's Clear Creek that runs in the back of it. There's visual barrier around the roadway. Um, but the pen is very large. They can actually fly in it. There's a live tree in it. Um, there's a giant snag. And what you're looking at is a mock power pole. Um, the release pens, all the field pens have mock power poles. We have a mock power pole. Um, it is electrified. It doesn't give a massive shock, but it's super uncomfortable. Um, they only land on it once. It's kind of funny, but uh, they, and it will shock them. And they never go back to it. Um, before this was implemented in the program, they used to lose condors that would um, perch on a power pole because, you know, it's, it's high, it's in the, you know, it's open, they can sit there, but their wings are so big um, that uh, they would arc and electrocute themselves. So since this power pole was um, brought into existence, they have not lost anybody from perching on power poles. So it works. Um, the back, that shed area back there, that is our holding room where we both feed and catch birds. Uh, so we can put calves in there um, and they'll drag the calves out of the lower door um, into the pen um, and they have access that way. And then when we wanna catch birds, what we do is we bait it with, um, they love rabbits. So we usually put rabbits and stuff in there and they'll drop in through that upper door and when everybody's in there uh, or whoever we want to catch is in there, we'll slide that shut 
And then again, we can go in from behind and catch those birds. Um, the picture next to it is, those are kiddos two years ago um, that we have caught out of uh, quarantine. They're all wing tagged. You can see a little bit of pink and blue. Pink uh, is, um, is tagged on the left for girls and blue is tagged on the right for boys. Um, these guys are all lined up. We're about to actually catch them up, put them in the crates um, and ship them. Um, I think these were all going to Arizona. Um, and so that's, that's just, that's what they look like right before they get shipped. Um, total condors, uh, 69, eggs laid, 125. Um, we do, so eggs transferred in, we do occasionally transfer eggs. Um, some places, um, are like, hey, do you have room for this egg? So we'll transfer them in. Um, 42 eggs infertile, or that's EED for the egg death. Um, and then 85 kiddos hatched so far. Uh, so when they are taken down to the release site, um, there is Arizona, um, Southern California, um, Big Sur, Pinnacles, and then Baja um, are all the release sites. We usually are genetic. Um, because all our birds are, are put together um, by our geneticists. So the, the group, our genetics usually most fit into is going to be Arizona or California. I think we've only had one recommended for Baja. Um, these are the left hand picture is the pen and the release pen and pinnacles. The bird inside the netting is, uh, I think that's 842 that we just drove down and released in there. You'll see there's two birds on the outside of the netting. Those are wild birds. And they will come down and look at the fresh meat. Be like, hey. So, um, so it's great socialization, but they will go hang around um, on top, look at all the new recruits. Same with Bitter Creek, um, the, the lower one, um, that is the flight pen at Bitter Creek. You'll see the adult and juvenile hanging out on top. Um, and then uh, you'll see they have a power pole in there and you can see it's a beautiful landscape behind them, but um, that is their pre-release pen. So sometimes they'll stay in the pens. Usually you wanna stay, have them stay at least three weeks, um, but about that time, so they're acclimated uh, you can make sure the stress wasn't too much for them from shipping and handling and doing all of that stuff. Um, and they are released in small cohorts. Um, so maybe two, three, four birds at a time. Um, they're all wing tagged, transmitters put on them, uh, but they want to release them at stage intervals. So especially for the first week, they can keep up with those release birds and make sure they're roosting properly um they don't get stuck somewhere weird um and when they've said okay yeah they found a proper roost tree they're in with the rest of the group they're doing great they'll go ahead and release another cohort um this is just a picture of um they have some cat that chick is not dead the chick is fine it looks kind of dead um they uh do they have put in cameras in um some of their nest caves and a lot of it you can go on to the ventana or the u.s fish and wildlife website and during breeding season you can actually bring up uh these cameras and and watch the nesting process um i just think this is a cool picture that's a female with um her kiddo and you can see um the amazing backdrop they have out of there um occasionally they do lose um, juvenile condors from falling off the edge of cliffs, but that is what it is. Uh, not to be morbid, I have better pictures after this, but um, one of the biggest obstacles uh, facing condors is lead. Um, it's about 50% of the mortalities in condors uh, is lead-based, it's from ammunition, um, not just from hunters, it's from farmers, ranchers, people who go out and hunt environments. It's anybody using lead ammunition and leaving anything in the field. Um, so you can kind of see known causes of mortality in the wild. 50% uh, were lead based. Um, the picture on the right always kind of gets me. 
Um, that picture was taken by Eddie Feltes um, of the Peregrine Program. He was monitoring um, a female in Arizona and her transmitter, her wing tag put out a mortality signal, which means the bird hasn't moved in, in 24 hours. Um, sometimes it means they're sick. Sometimes it means they're, they're, they've eaten their fill and they're just sitting there. Um, but this particular one, Eddie took that picture and those are bird tracks in the sand and those lines on the sides are the wing drags. Um, the bird is just walking, it can't fly anymore. Um, it's so debilitated that it's just, it's dragging its wings. Um, that's what lead looked like. Um, there was a dead bird at the end of this, this trail. Um, it looks like this in condors, it looks like this in eagles, it looks like this in any bird that scavenges um, and any, any scavenger. So that's, that's what it looks like. It's, it's ugly. Um, so I had to put that in there, um, not to be a downer, sorry. Uh, these are, numbers are constantly fluctuating. Um, started from 22 birds um, up to 446. Um, these numbers have changed a little bit, especially after this last year. Um, unfortunately, this last year, California lost 30% um, of their wild population to fires and lead. Um, so it was a, it was a massive hit. Um, so we need to bring more birds. So those numbers as of to date might not be exactly accurate. Um, we also have other assorted animals out here. Um, we have three goats. Um, the black one in front, his name is Justice. He's Dirty Uncle Justice. And then um, we have our two big goats in back that have gotten into the, the grain bin. Um, we use them out, out here um, near the pins, in the pins, uh, to keep all of the vegetation stuff down because we, we don't want to go in. We don't want to use um, any machinery in there. It makes them, it totally wigs them out. So we use goats um, and there's some of our, I love those guys. Justice is hilarious. He's an, he's an old stinky man. Um, we also uh, are kind of in a wetland area. So the picture on the right, Mary is standing uh, in front of a cottonwood tree that the beavers have been working on and are determined to take down. Um, or they just put their children in timeout and that's the tree they use, like go chew on that tree. Um, so we do have a large colony of beavers out here. Um, we're constantly in battle with them so they don't flood our pens, um, but we love them. Uh, but yeah, it's just, it's the war against beaver. Like we have to break down the dam, like, oh, this is flooding again, like go. And then, you know, by the next morning, they're like, nah, build it back up. So we do, we do have a ton of wildlife out here. It's beautiful. Um, it's 72 acres and we just have 52 fenced in. These are kind of random um, pictures. People a lot of times will ask, um, how, do, how do condors do in the cold? Like they're California birds. No, they do fine. Um, they, <laughs> I mean, they look miserable. They actually do fine. They're really, really sturdy birds. Um, I have had, we've had ice storms out here where I've literally had um, ice, like an ice coat on their back and icicles hanging off of them. Um, they have access to their nest rooms 24 seven. It's, you know, it's warm in there, but they choose to just sit and look miserable, um, and not go in that nest room if it's not breeding season. I don't know why, but they do fine in really all types of weather. This, I love this picture because this picture is what the face that you'll see right before you get a chunk taken out of you somewhere. Um, condors are made to rip um, flesh from bone. Um, we do handle them, um, mostly without gloves on. Um, all of us have been bit at some time or another. It's just happened with the sheer volume of birds we work with. Um, it does leave a mark. Um, I love this picture. Um, I've had one bird his name is Lippy. Um, sent me to the hospital twice, once for because he took a chunk out of my face and once because I got an infection. He's my nemesis. Anyway, he's down in LA. 
Um, so that's um, kind of an overall view of uh, my presentation. Um, and um, I guess I will give it back for questions. I'm gonna do this. Is that good? Perfect. Okay. All right, thank you so much, Kelly. That was great. Um, we have had a few questions come in, so we'll go ahead and jump right into those. Um, we have, they're kind of all over the place. We'll start um, with some of the, the questions about eggs. Okay. Um, so someone is wondering when they double clutch, if the rate of infertility in the eggs is greater um, than the first egg in the second egg. Um, is it sort of correlation? Yeah, that is a good, that's a good question. Um, usually, no. In fact, a lot of times um, the first egg will um, be uh, more often infertile than the second egg. Um, occasionally, we do have birds that go into breeding season, female gets excited and, and like doesn't matter, just drops an egg. Um, we're like, okay, that, that doesn't work very well. Um, and so we'll pull that and then the second one, um, will be fertile, but it's, it's actually pretty good. They, we try not to do, um, we try not to double clutch everybody and not all of them are recommended. They used to, when the program, um, first got started and they really needed chicks on the ground, um, they used to triple clutch the females, um, which is really hard on them, but, um, but yeah, the fertility rate still stays good. Thanks. Um, someone else is wondering when breeding season for condors is. Um, we start in Oregon. So there's four facilities. I forgot to mention this. Sorry, everybody. Um, there's LA, San Diego, Oregon, and Boise. Uh, we are the only four institutions that breed condors for release. Our breeding season, we see displays start in December. Um, this year is kind of an aberration. We have eight eggs. Um, but we usually get our first eggs um, the end of January. San Diego is normally always spot on two weeks ahead of us. So we know when they get their first egg, we're like, OK, put it on the calendar because we'll get our first egg two weeks later. Um, LA is on about the same timeline as us. Boise is later. Boise is usually two weeks later than us. And then in the wild, they're just getting going right now. So you're seeing a lot of displays. Um, so, and I don't know why, why it is that, that breeding, um, in captivity ramps up sooner than, um, in the wild, but they're, they're just getting going. And it, I mean, really it lasts until that chick leaves the, the the pair and sometimes in the wild they stay with them um for a couple years so with us it's the same time great um so you kind of touched you ended up to this question came in a little bit early and you touched on it a little bit as you went through your talk um but someone was wondering what their nests are made of. So if you could kind of just give an overview of that. And it was, I think he means um, the nests in your facility, the things that kind of look like domes, um, but then you can also talk about their nests in the wild as well. Yeah, so um, in captivity, uh, basically all the captive programs have kind of the same type of nest room. It's, um, it's basically plywood and the floor is covered. Um, we use beach sand um and it's, the sand is cleaned every year um because it gets so nasty after five or six months um so when the chick uh fledges out and we're able we have like a month and a half window where we pull the chicks and the, it's before breeding season and we clean everything and and so we'll clean all that stuff up we'll scrape off the walls <laughs> it's disgusting um but that's what we do um the birds have a great time chewing on stuff they'll rip apart stuff um again they are monkeys with feathers and they're just like i need to decorate and you know, sometimes you'll come in you'll be like that's a piece of my building laying like in your nest room or in the pen like okay well as long as there's no nails on it like fine um so um the chicks are entertained again the parents will bring it up in the wild there is a diverse array um arizona it's pretty much um 
sides of, of cliff walls, um, little, little cavities in there. In California, um, they'll also nest in those giant redwoods that have lost the top. Um, they have um, one of their females is called Redwood Queen. Um, and they that's like her nest that she did lose her mate this year in, in the Dolan fire. Um, but um, I think they have three or four nests in redwood trees. Um, but normally it's just kind of the side of, of cliffs for nesting. So you talked a lot about how clean um, your incubation room is. Okay. And someone is wondering whether the eggs can be infected from the outside. Um, yeah, so it is kind of funny to look at like, oh, here's the nest room that the eggs hatch in and it's disgusting and dirty. And then you have like this sterile clean incubation room. Like why? Um, the egg shells are porous and that's actually how the oxygen gets exchanged, exchanged um, is through there. So that eggshell can absorb whatever gets on the outside of that egg, which includes um, greasy primate stuff. Um, they are not evolved to handle the bacteria and the viruses that we carry around, greasy primates. Um, so we wanna put that, um, to bed. We don't want any bacteria in there, any viruses, anything. They're, they're evolved to deal with the poop covered whatever uh, in uh, their nest areas, but that is why it is so, so clean. Um, occasionally it happens, it shouldn't happen, but uh, we just want to make sure to limit that as much as possible. Great. Um, so Couple different questions about size. Someone is wondering how big they are about when they're hatched and someone else is wondering how big they can get. Um, it's kind of, it's hard to tell. Okay, so this is a dummy egg. This is the egg, size of the egg. So you can kind of see how big it is. Um, and they come out of this, so this is how big they are when they hatch. Um, this is an actual dummy egg that we replace the real eggs with. Uh, when we go reach in, we'll just plop this thing in there. So size comparison, um, it's kind of remarkable. They are, oh, probably smaller than a, a robin. And then um, when they hatch and they're small and white and fluffy, and then you have this adult uh, come in who um, has a nine and a half foot wingspan, um, stands about, you know, neck stretched out three feet tall um, and can weigh about 20 pounds. Um, it, it, the difference is remarkable. So it does take them six months to grow to that size. Um, that's why they're in there so long. Their development is, it takes forever. Um, one of the things that they do to help that the condor um, development is the parents will, um, we call it bone foraging, but they'll, they'll go in the pen or in the wild um, and bone forage. And they'll actually feed their chicks bits of bone for that calcium um, boost uh, because there's so much energy required. Um, condors are the biggest soaring birds uh, in North America. If you get like, okay, bald eagles are big. You get a nice healthy female uh, bald eagle, she'll weigh 12 to 14 pounds. Um, our ad average female condor uh, weighs 18 to 20 pounds. Um, some of the males get up to like 25 pounds. Um, they are massive, massive birds. Um, so yeah, they do start out teeny tiny, but they grow very fast. So this is kind of getting into some of the questions about handling, um, the birds in the conservation center. So, um, someone is asking you when they believe that you mentioned, and I, I think you mentioned this, um, that when you do their yearly physicals, that you capture them in the feed rooms, is that correct? That is correct. Yeah, so, um, sorry, go ahead. Oh, so the question then was, um, if so, do you ever find that you have setbacks with the birds being unwilling to come back in um, oh. for feeding or is it more of a forgive and forget type of situation? Oh, they never forget you. <laughs> um, no, so, we now what we do because we used to try to vaccinate and mostly it's to get our hands on them, um, really get a feel and make sure everything's okay. And they also get vaccinated um, for West Nile virus um, that needs to happen. 
we used to try to, and we just kind of switched this over. We used to try to um, get every bird every year. But a lot of times what would happen is we'll trap one of them and they'll be like, oh, it's trapping season. I can totally outweigh you. And they will, like they would in two weeks. And you're just like, come on in. They're like, no. So um, now like this year we trapped all the males and next year we'll trap all the females. Um, but yeah, what you have to do is after you trap them, you have to do your mea culpa, like I'm so sorry. And you have to leave both doors open and you have to put all the food up front of the magic food room door. So when you open it, the food's right there because they don't trust you anymore. Um, so yeah, like, sorry. Um, and then eventually we'll start a custom, um, getting them accustomed to dropping into food rooms again when they have their chicks because they'll have to eventually drop in because the chicks will be so hungry. So they'll drop in and eat as much as they can. And then, so yeah, we do the whole thing all over again. But yeah, they are totally unforgiving. <laughs> um, I love that you talk about them all like they have their own personalities, which they I'm sure. Do. Yeah. yeah, totally. So we have um, some of them. I mean, they they're amazing, and that's what makes managing them kind of hard um, because we have dominant birds, we have subdominant, we have stubborn birds, we have you know, no offense, not very bright birds. We have um, things that will do everything they can to like destroy your thought of what you thought a condor was. It'll be like, nope. Um, so just um seeing them interact with each other and making sure that pair is doing okay for that pair um is is a lot of it um some pairs will do very specific things that is fine with that pair but if another pair did it we're like run down like save somebody um the pairs are put together um by genetics um because the population is so small so they don't get to choose it, in the wild, they, they totally get to choose. Obviously, it's a free-for-all. But um, in captivity, we try to keep those genetics um, as, as distant as possible. So we do um, put them together by genetics. We try to keep them together as long as possible. Um, it, it's really bad for the birds to be like, oh, you match you know, this one over here because they are mated for life. So maybe once every 10 years, we'll do a reevaluation and be like, OK, how well is this pair represented? Do we need to keep them together? Are they so well represented? Maybe we could do a different pair. So that happens very occasionally. We've been to LA, had this happen. Um, you'll put them together and they don't like each other, um, like at all. And you know immediately when they don't like each other. Um, like, well, that, that didn't work. So um, I don't know, I'm just telling stories, but I mean, they're funny to me um we have now la has her we had her for a while her name is is tama she's um one of the original founding birds she's from the wild they refer to her as the battle axe she is she's she's a whore to manage like she just she loves fighting and she loves ripping things apart and she's you're just like oh tama um so she had to be separated from her mate because they were so well represented and they needed to get her genetics and with a new line so they came up with some some numbers and one of them was his stomach number is 385 that was lippy that is my nemesis that sent me to the hospital twice i'm like fantastic he's gonna go down and he's gonna be put in with the battle axe um but he was you know he was a pretty strong personality it wasn't i didn't think it was gonna be a big deal well she, he was terrified of her like terrified of her she would take all his food run around the pen be like no you sit over there and he'd be like okay i'm sorry um and she did that with two males and they couldn't pair her up with anybody so there was another bird from boise his name was may may and he was very very naughty and did and um uh, almost well tried to kill his mate he didn't succeed anyway he was taken out of that pair um and la was like and we didn't have anywhere to put may may because we didn't trust him anymore because he had done so much damage uh so la said We'll try and we'll put him in with Tama. So they put Mimi in. Um, the condors literally rolled around on the ground for two days straight fighting. Condors have two types of fighting. One's for dominance. And if nobody comes up really bleeding, it's still OK. Um, if somebody's actively bleeding or you know being hammered on, you want to separate them. But nobody's actively bleeding. They fought for two days. Um, Tama then said, you are acceptable. 
and kind of hot. So now Tama and Mei Mei are together. So that's what you feel like when you deal with these. <laughs> I love your stories. So <laughs> keep sharing them. Um, we are getting a little close on time. So we'll go ahead and start wrapping it up. Um, someone is wondering if there are any plans to release condors here in Oregon into the wild. Um, there's no plans as of yet. So a couple, a couple of, of major reasons. Um, one is that um, we have to start doing more lead outreach and more lead education, which we've really started to. The zoo has hired Leland, who's brilliant, um, does a lot of lead outreach in Oregon. So we're kind of meeting that goal. Um, the other thing, the Yurok tribe in Northern California is uh, planning on doing a release maybe fall, but probably not fall. It's probably gonna have to be spring. We're not sure yet. Um, but they're right on the, on the border basically. So the birds are going to be in Oregon in the next year or so. Um, but right now, especially since we had the Dolan fire and lost all those breeders in California, there's just not enough birds. Um, you can't keep starting release sites if you don't have like a really healthy population. Otherwise, you're just kind of throwing birds away, which is not great. So if you start a release site, you need to know that that new release site is actually taking birds out of the established populations that could be breeders. So they get less birds. So Oregon would be several years um, away because we just, we, we don't have the ability to make enough birds um, to start that population. Um, but they will be, and you know, hopefully they'll just, they'll eventually move up the coastline and be in Oregon. So yeah. Um, and so we'll end with one more question, which I think is going to relate back to what you were just mentioning. Um, I'm guessing that the release um, in collaboration with the Yurok tribe is related to someone's asking about the status of the Northern Redwoods test release. I don't know if those are the same or different, or if you know. What I think that is the same. Um, that is going to be the only release in Northern California, and it is very, very close to the Redwoods. You're literally looking over the Redwoods into the ocean. Um, they've ran in, they ran into, they've run into um, a couple of hiccups and um, like the memorandum of understanding. Um, there's a lot of stuff that goes into it in a lot of different agencies. Oregon Zoo is partnering because we'll um, go ahead and uh, help treat lead uh, cases and sick birds and all of that. We also have holding spaces if they need to do it. Um, so they have a few zoos on board. They have to deal with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and then um, uh, the tribes because it's and the parks. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a whole lot into it. So things just kind of get held up. And again, we're not sure we have the birds this fall to put in there, um, but it should definitely happen this year. So yeah. Perfect. Well, I just want to thank you again. Um, you can imagine a whole room full of people applauding for you right now. Um, I'm sure they're all out there doing that, um, those who have tuned in tonight. And um, best of luck with this year's uh, thank you. eggs. Yeah. I know that it's been a really busy couple of weeks for you with um, the volume that you've gotten so early so soon. So thanks for taking the time out this evening to share it with everyone. Um, and to all of you watching, thanks for tuning in and we'll see you uh, next month. Thank you. Thank you.